Welcome, welcome. Yeah. They're very, very excited here. Amen. You may be seated. I am in Ghana. I'm in Ghana. Yeah. And I'm in Accra, Ghana, by the way. So I'm with Pastor Joshua Dagg. Thank you. You may be seated. And I'm, I'm, I'm here to talk to these pastors, wonderful pastors, most of whom are very young-looking people. And by the way, this all you hear, it's just them. <laughs> and I'm going to share this with you all around the world, what I'll be really sharing with them, these wonderful, incredible young people here. I love that. Anyway, so we want to share this with the world because I believe that God will use what I will say and talk about with you who are ministers and preachers around the world who are young and the old too because we all need it. So let's first pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love. Oh, how we thank you for your love. And Lord, I pray today you'll touch your ministers, your people worldwide. Thank you for this divine moment for all of us here in Ghana. Thank you for the privilege you've given all of us to serve you. What a privilege we have in you, Lord. Thank you. And I pray today you'll give us such clarity to hear your voice. And Lord, I pray that your voice will be so clear and loud in our hearts where we will not question it. And we pray that what you'll say to us will make us all better leaders with more impact around the world. We will give you all the glory and honor and praise. And that's our vow. We will give you the glory. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. And let's say hello to Pastor Dan Willis from Chicago. And he and I have been friends a long time. <laughs> they said, wow. Maybe they're amazed by how long we have known you, huh? By a long time. And, and, and tonight, he, he, he looks like a general. Yeah. Now, I call him captain. I call him captain. You told me Dennis. to dress casual. This is casual. <laughs> For Chicago. I'm from Chicago, I mean, so this is casual. Wow. And he have a, he, by the way, he has a big church, the largest church, the largest multicultural church in Chicago. Yes, sir. And he's, I'm glad he's with us. So we're going to talk about what I believe is going to be so important to our, to our life. And I'm going to just sit down here. Oh, that feels lovely. And feel free, by the way, Pastor Josh, uh, Pastor Joshua, feel, feel free to ask me questions if you, if you want to, because I think it, it'll pull more out of me. And your darling wife is here. <laughs> Dear Pastor Kiki, I want you to stand up so can, they, they can see how, please, please. Give her a big God bless. Come on, guys. I she's, wish she's, I wish she's I already had, taken. Pardon? She's already taken. I'm just. Oh yeah. Running, uh, I just gone. I just wish I can have hair like her. In fact, I used to, but then look what happened to me. So we are sitting here to, uh, here tonight in beautiful Accra, Ghana, very relaxed and casual. So let's begin by talking. And I know you want to hear more about the Holy Spirit, and I want to talk about the Blessed Holy Spirit. But, but I do, I do want to begin with just a few things I think will help all of you also. Because today, the question today, sadly, among God's people, we don't really care what the world thinks. That's another problem, and they can have it. But what we care about is what, the, what God's people think, Amen. what the church thinks, and what the church believes, and what, sadly, today people are questioning 
that should not be questioned. So let's talk about the Bible. Because people today are questioning the Bible. Well, you know, when, when, when someone questions any part of the Bible, it's dangerous. Because what else will they question? Right. See that? But God has given us such amazing uh, proof that his word is his word. And he has, he has given us so much. You know, God hides nothing from us. God hides nothing from us. He gives us everything to know and more and much more. God has no secrets with us. We have secrets with our family members. We have secrets with our wife or husband. There are things only God knows about us. Now that's a fact. I mean, humanly speaking, we all have things in our hearts we don't want anyone to know about except God. But God has nothing in his heart that he will not show us. Think about that. That God will show us more as his people than we want to show anyone. We have secrets. God has no secrets from us. Everything that God is, we can know today. Everything he knows, we can know today. Because the Bible is clear on that. That we are his people. And the Holy Spirit reveals the depth of God Almighty. Because it says in Scripture, he knows the deep things of God and reveals them to us. Think about just those words. Nobody knows us like God knows us. He knows our depth. He knows us better than we know ourselves. So think about the fact that we can know him. We can know him as he is. And we're the only people who can know him. The angels cannot know him. Think about what I just said. Angels cannot know God because he's revealed by his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will not reveal God to the angels. They have no capacity to know him. Everything they know about him, they know by watching the way he deals with you. I'm looking at the faces that are like, oh. Everything, everything. Everything the angels know about God, they know by watching the way he deals with us. It says so in Ephesians. He says, unto the principalities and powers are known by the church, by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. So only the church, the angels see us as their classroom. They are educated by watching us. That's amazing. It is beautiful. Because God reveals them to us. And then they want, to, they, they want to know what God is like. They have to look at us. That's why they desire to look into the things of salvation. And the Bible says that. So think about how much we can have. So here's my advice to you. Don't get to heaven and find out how much you missed on earth. Yeah, this guy just did this to his head. <laughs> Think about how many people are going to get to heaven and find out they missed so much about God and knowing God here on earth because we can know him now, today. How? By his Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we, we, we cannot know him. So, so today people are questioning the Bible. Well, they just don't know the Bible. And God has given us such proof, such evidence such evidence. So if somebody, let's say, comes to you and says, well, you know, I don't believe this and that about the Bible, and they'll say some whatever question they have, ask them a question. So you say to whoever, how many prophecies are in, let's say, the book of some other religion? You can name the name of other religions, whether Hinduism, Buddhism, or all the isms. 
How many prophecies are in those books? Zero. There are zero prophecies in any book of any world religion. Because they know that if one prophecy is not fulfilled, yeah. they, they'll question. The whole thing comes down. The whole religion collapses. Now, how many, and then ask them, how many prophecies are in the Bible? 2,500. How many? So now God gives us all these prophecies, and then you ask them, how many of them have been fulfilled? 2,000. Now you ask and you think yourself, what are the chances? And even three could be fulfilled. Humanly impossible. That's Spanish, by the way. Because there's no way even three can be fulfilled that had been spoken hundreds of years before. So God gives us 2,500 prophecies fulfilled in detail. In detail. 332 were fulfilled in detail when Jesus came to earth. So he fulfilled 332 prophecies with such incredible detail. And that's the first time he came. The second time he returns and comes, he'll fulfill the 500 prophecies about his reign, millennium reign on the earth, and more than that, restoring his people Israel, and so much more. So think about the, 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 the amazing power of the Bible that God gives us the, the, the evidence, yeah. it's his word, yeah. by going back and looking at, at, at history and seeing it fulfilled. The prophets looked ahead. We look back and say, oh my Lord, look at that. Example, if you look at Micah 5, it talks about Jesus being born in Bethlehem. And it says, out of the Ephrata will he come and then it, it says, who is from everlasting. That's incredible. And fulfilled in detail. Or in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it talks about unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. His government will be upon his shoulder and so on. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. That that child is Mighty God. That son is Mighty God. And today they question all that. And so many incredible prophecies about his life fulfilled in such incredible details. So once you ask them that, they, 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 they will be uh, stunned with no answers. But there are some people today that question even the Bible, say, well, I don't believe that. Okay, how about history? God went beyond the Bible for the world, not for us. We don't need history. I don't need to know history to know that the Bible is true. See? We just need to know the Word by the Spirit. And that's all we need. But the world may say, well, yeah, but the Bible, and they'll give you whatever reasons. It's okay. How about history? And just ask them one simple question. How many documents in the world today, in any library, will talk about Caesar, Augustus Caesar. Nine. There are nine documents in the libraries of the world. Nobody questions that there was a Caesar because of those nine documents. How many about Jesus? Historical documents. Eighty percent of them written by atheists who are not even believers. How many documents are in the world today that say there was a man named Jesus who lived, performed miracles, who died, and rose from the dead? Now, they don't say rose. They'll say his followers say he rose. Fine, that doesn't matter. At least they say that. How many documents? 39. So there are 30 more documents than Caesar in the world. 
historical documents, preserved. So you can walk into any library and be convinced if you, if you were interested to find who Jesus was. You can, any library without even knowing the Bible, that's all there. Enough documents today about the Bible and what the Bible says in libraries. You know, still it's, it's amazing how many historical documents there are about the Lord. And God went beyond that. He went into archaeology. Because some may say, well, I don't know why I believe the historians. Okay, let's go into archaeology. Today, through archaeology in the Holy Land and around the Holy Land, whether it's Egypt or other countries, there is strong evidence that you can see, you can touch with your hands, you can walk upon, that proves the Bible. But I was amazed one day, and by the way, today Israeli archaeologists, who are the best in the world, by the way, use the Bible for the roadmap. That's a fact, Pastor Joshua. They no longer use any other book but the Bible. These are Israeli, Jewish, non-believing. Non, they're not messianic. They're not even religious Jews. They're just Jews who are archaeologists. They use the Bible to guide them. And they, and they, and they, they go straight right to the place. And it took them a few years to find out that the, that the Bible is true. So they began using it now as their, their roadmap. I was at the Pool of Siloam. You all heard about the Pool of Siloam. Yeah. So they, were, they, they just found it. Because the Pool of Siloam sits south and lower than Temple Mount. If you look on any map of Jerusalem, it's very hilly. Okay, the mountains and all that. So Temple Mount sits on a mountain. That's why it's called Temple Mount. Then you go down to a valley and there was a pool called Siloam or Siloam when the Lord said to the blind man, go, go and wash. Okay? Now from the Temple Mount to Siloam or Siloam are steps that the Bible talks about in Ezra in the Old Testament. Those steps are not mentioned in the New Testament. They're mentioned in the Old. Okay? So over the centuries, rain, mud, and whatever would, would go from the mountain down to the valley, and it covered the entire area. It, it was buried under mud. Later on in history, they built a town, an Arab village called Silwan. It's still there. From the name Siloam, they built a town named Silwan. You can actually go and see it. I've been there myself. So a guy who lived, an Arab, a Palestinian, who lived in Silwan, had a little broken pipe. And he called the city to help him fix it. So they got a company to come. Mm -hmm. And while they were fixing the pipe, they noticed something underneath. And they began digging, thinking there's something that could help them fix the whatever pipe. And they began to find that the, 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 the were there was evidence down there of some ruins, ancient ruins. And they questioned, they had questioned by, for hundreds of years, oh, we don't believe there was ever a city of David and Pool of Siloam, because that area was the city of David, where David had his palace, okay, where Solomon lived, where the kings are buried in the city of David. Well, it was all buried by mud from centuries of rain and earthquakes and whatever else and wars and all that. So now they, they, they see some, there's something, you know, in there. So they start digging and they find, to their amazement, biblical ruins that go thousands of years back to the reign of King David who built the city, where they had to buy the land from the Arabs to, to because now it had to go to the uh, Minister of, of Antiquities and so on, because now it's, it has to do with archaeology, so, yeah. So now they began digging more and more and more as they began to buy more homes, and they found the Pool of Siloam. 
And after they found it, I was there. Because my guide named Shraga said, oh, he was so excited because he just made such big news. He said, you want to see it? I said, you bet, let's go. <laughs> so I go in there and the archaeologists are still digging. And I'm right there. And then, excitedly, one of the archaeologists says, and those you know, people ever were digging, he said, we just found the steps. We just found the steps. And they were digging for the, there were maybe, maybe, oh, not even three steps found. And I got right in there with them. <laughs> I was right in there while they were getting the dirt out. And thousands and thousands of coins were found because with the mud came all the coins that have Hebrew letters on them. Now they deny that the Jews have any history, those enemies of Israel. They just need to look at the coins that have Hebrew letters with names and, and details of the life then. And now I'm in there, I said to the fellow, I said, can I have some of those coins? He, of course, so I dug and cleaned them all up. I took about 40, 50, stuck them right in my pocket. Now the thing is, anyone who questions archeology span is just blind, or they just don't wanna know. And since then, they have found much, much, much more than that. They found the entire steps. I've been there more than once. They found the actual castle that David lived in that is described in the Bible. They found, for example, the dungeon where Jeremiah was in. I stood there and saw it and was in tears while I looked at the very dungeon that they lowered Jeremiah in. It's all there. Really a little bit of what God has given us. There's so much more I can tell you about prophecy and history and archaeology, but my main interest is prophecy. What does the Bible show us that we can say with absolute fact to the world, this is the word of God? For how can it be that God could reveal such details about, let's say, Nebuchadnezzar, or Cyrus, or Darius, these kings that existed, or the history of his people that has taken place, or see with your eyes the present nation of Israel in prophecy. It's just mind-blowing, to be honest with you. And anyone who questions it is just blind, or they don't want to look long enough to see truth and fact. So. God's word, over and over and over, the Lord has given us such proof Amen. that the Bible is his word. But, but you know, there's one thing that, that you all will understand. I can read any book, and I love reading many Christian books. I don't read any and never have and never will read any secular books. I have no interest in them. What I read is the Bible, but I also love to read books that can help me understand more of the Bible. So, but how many times can, can you and I read a book that has blessed us? People tell me all the time about books I have, uh, that I have written. Millions have read Good Morning Holy Spirit, but if I should ask them how many, how many times have you read it, they'll say once, twice, max. How about the Bible? We cannot stop reading it. What is it, what is it that pulls us? See, why are we so taken by it? Because it's life-giving. It's God's word. It, it never gets old. Never gets old. You, 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 you think about over something, I think 20,000 copies of the Bible, till today, 24,000 of the Bible sell every minute on earth. 24,000 copies sell every minute on earth. What other book sells like that? 
and still selling. No publisher, no agent, no, publisher, no, agent, no nothing. It's God. It's God. But the impact the Bible has had on the world, on Western society, and more than that, the Bible is God's word. Now, how are we affected by it? Well, it changes our lives. It transforms us into the image of Jesus. But we need the Holy Spirit for that. Because the Bible by itself will not change you. But the Spirit of God using His Word will change you. So I say to people, now, if you only have the Word, you'll dry up. If you only have the Spirit, you'll blow up. If you have both, you'll grow up. All right? So, people, people that... that People that only have the word, dry up. People who want the power, blow up. And people that have both, grow up. So we need both. So, like, you, you, you think about Paul the Apostle, before he, he, he became Paul the Apostle, when he was Saul, and he wasn't saved. He knew the Bible, but he did not know the Lord. Because the word dried him up. <laughs> he, he had no revelation truth that he would actually think he was serving God by persecuting the church because he was blinded to the fact that this is the word of God. He didn't see it in spirit. Today there are people just like Saul of Tarsus who call themselves Christians or preachers who don't know the Lord. They know doctrine, but they don't know the Lord. They worship doctrine. They don't worship the Lord. And you know them because they're legalistic. Anyone who is controlling and legalistic does not know the Lord. Because the Lord does not bring, bring people into bondage. He sets them free from bondage. Yeah. And the difference is when you know it's Jesus, it's one simple thing. He leads. He doesn't push. If, if, if ever you feel you're being forced into something, it's not the Lord. So always keep this in mind. The devil pushes and Jesus leads. So the devil says, do it. Or I'll, whatever, he'll punish you. And he'll force you to go. He'll force you to do. That's demonic. But when someone says, follow me, and you have the choice to follow or not to follow, you have the liberty to say yes or no, that's the Lord. So Jesus said, follow me. Then we choose to follow or not follow. Thank God we've chosen to follow. Amen. So because we have seen his, his love... Look, the power of God, we need it because the power of God through us, through us, and I'll talk about this in just a little bit on the, different, the difference in the power of God and the presence of God and so on. But, you know, people are always looking to know the power. I want the power. No, no, no. Because people who are only looking for the power will become fanatics. Yeah, because they have to know the Lord. To know the Holy Spirit means you know the person. Because when people see the Holy Spirit as power or influence, then they, they, they want to use him. But when they see him as a person, then they say, use me, Lord. See that the difference? So if I see the Holy Ghost as power, I want to use him. If I see him as a person, I'll say, use me. I surrender to a person to be used by the Lord, you see. So important. So, but it's the love. It's the love of Jesus that changes you. And all you receive from his word is his love, his nature, his mercy, his faithfulness. All that changes your life. 
And the more you see the Lord, the more you change. You want to become like him. You have this desire in you to be free from the sins of the flesh and the sins and filth of the world. And, every, and in you becomes, there comes a cry, Lord, I want to know you, please. And you, 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 you cry and you, you want to be delivered from sin. That's what it means to be brokenhearted. Blessed are the poor in spirit, you know. Those who are, who, who, who are so broken over their sin, blessed are they that mourn, mourning over what? Not mourning for because somebody died, mourning over our sins. So that's the real Christian who has a broken heart and a broken spirit that God will not despise. So it's his love that, that just changes you completely. And you see that as you live for the Lord. It's a process. You, you'll not know it all in one week or even one year or even 10 years. I've been walking with the, with the Lord now over 51 years. Almost 52, to be honest with you. It'll be, it'll be 52 years this year that I've walked with God. I've been serving him almost now. I'm into my 49th year. But you learn. But what do you learn? Well, the, f the first thing you learn is the Lord himself. Who is he? What's, what, what's his nature like? Then you learn about ministry and Christian life and so on. But the, the one thing we want to know is, I want to know him. It's not about knowledge. It's about the knowledge of Jesus, the knowledge of the Lord. That's what changes all of us. And that's what you as ministers need here and throughout the world. Get to know him. How? Through his word, by his spirit. Because you have to ask the Holy Spirit to help you find and discover the Lord in his precious word. And the Bible has amazing depth, you know. Now, I believe that the Bible has seven levels, and I won't get into that. Because most Christians don't, don't even know that. There are, there are different levels to the word of God that you just get into deeper as you, be, as you grow. So... Level number one is information. Level number two, God's plan for you. But then level number three will change your life because level number three is Jesus in the Old Testament. Finding the Lord in every type, in every shadow. Oh, that is so ah, amazing. And I discovered that when I became a pastor, that there's more about the Bible than the knowledge of the word or what God has planned for my life and so on and so forth. You discover the Lord. You discover the Lord in every story. There are many hidden, amazing revelations of the Lord. And I tell people all the, you know, all the time, just well, like example, how many times can you read about you know, Adam? We, we, we knew those in, the, in Sunday school. You know, how God put him to sleep. Well, that's the death of Christ. And then God opened his side. That's what happened on the cross. His side was open. Then he took out a bone and gave him a wife. And the Lord from his side came to the church. So you see how every detail in the Old Covenant has a revelation of the Lord. And that's incredible. Or oh, dear God, how many times can you read about Joseph? They've made movie, you know, movies about Joseph, but nobody talks about Jesus in Joseph. It's not about Joseph. God was revealing Jesus through Joseph. And these depths are like, <gasps> you, you, just, you just fall in love with the Bible all over again. Because now you're looking for the Lord. It's no longer about reading it and reading it and reading it and reading it, and you've already read it. You can, you know by heart every story of the Old Testament, on and on and on and on and on. But the thing that is so remarkable is when you discover the depth. I can keep you here for a whole year telling you about that. Pastor, tell us about Joseph. Joseph, yeah, easy. Yeah, I love hearing you tell us. Okay. okay. Loved by his father. 
hated by his brothers. Who is that? Jesus. Jesus. His father loved him, his nation hated him. Okay? Then he was sold. <laughs> Happened to the Lord too, right? Then he was placed in a pit. That's his death. That's his death. The death of Christ. Then later we see the life of Joseph when he went to prison. The Lord went to where? The underworld. He went to the prison to open the gates. And then Joseph came out of prison. That's the resurrection of the Lord. Pardon? Two people in prison as well. Exactly. Well, you're, you're giving them too many details. So I'm sorry. But we'll just keep going. Thank you. Yeah. I love it. And, and then, not only did he rise from the dead, Pharaoh gave Joseph what? The throne. Sit on my right hand. Who's not, not Joseph. It's the Lord. And then he gave him what? A Gentile wife. He gave him a Gentile wife. Who is that? The church, you. So there he is. Take your seats. And he was revealed. Take your seats. That's, you need to preach that one, guys, all of you. You pastors, preach it. And he was revealed to each nation the second time. On the second visit, remember? He revealed himself. It's all about the Lord. And other details. Oh, dear God. I was studying a few days ago. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar went into the wilderness and became an animal for seven years. That has to do with the tribulation. Because the, 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 he was symbolic of the world that the world will go into a seven period of tribulation. There's so much in Daniel that's mind boggling. And there's so much in the Ark of Noah. Do you know that the uh, Ark landed on the mountains of Ararat on the exact date of the Lord's resurrection? Who is the Ark? Same date. You say, well, why does God hide these things? So you can search. Because you'll never get the jewelry and the beauty of the Bible without searching the scriptures. Not reading only, but searching the scriptures. So I would recommend, can I have my iPad? I want to show them something, Pastor. Yeah. Now, I read my Bible. That's why I have this. Thank you, Captain. <laughs> so with my Bible, I'll show you something. This here is Bible only. Bible only iPad. I would recommend, you see, all these are my Bibles. All these are Bibles. More Bibles. Just Bibles, 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 all the Bibles. I have the Hebrew Bible here. And, and I can read Hebrew, by the way. But, but my favorite of all is the King James Strong's. Because what I like about it is when you touch uh, a word, it gives, you, it gives you the meaning in the strong. So when you go, let's say, to Judah and you go to the, to the strong, it gives you everything about the word. So you don't have to have books now. Back years ago when I was young and there was no iPads, I had books hundreds of books on the floor when I would study. Now, I just do this. I just doop, boop, boop, that's it. I touch it and it's there. It works, it works greatly, yeah. But the, the thing that I, I, I found, because I wanted to know more about the Bible. So, I was reading, to my amazement, I was reading Genesis and I was reading chapter 5. 
And I looked at the names, at the names, and I'm, you can color it just like I do here. Yeah? So I was looking at the names of the saints, of the saints. So it talks about, you know, Adam, he had a son, and he called him, you know, Seth and so on. And then one day I, I kind of did this. I wanted to know what the name Seth means, Seth. So, and, and you, you see substitute or appointed. And then you begin putting it together. From, from Adam to Noah is the gospel. It's, did you hear what I said? God revealed the plan of salvation through the names of the righteous. All right, let's do this. Okay. okay? So when, when you go through Scripture and you put your... And there's ways now... And some, some, some of, these, of, these, of, of these words you have to really look for because yeah. they, they can mean more than one word. But I'll, I will give it to you right now. So when I began finding it, I was stunned. I was stunned because of such depth. That's why I talked to you about more than one level. So this is a fourth level of the Bible. It's when you read. I was just showing Lucas here. I did a study years ago on the names of the sons of, of, of Jacob. And I found it's the story of the church. Yeah, because Reuben, Reuben means look at my son. I showed those notes. One day I need to bring that back. You remember from, from OCC days. And then Simeon or Shimon means listen to him. Yeah. And then Levi, it means cling to him. Do you remember what the mother said? Okay, now my husband will cling to me and so on. Okay. And then what does Judah mean? Praise him. And if you go through the names, every one of them has to do with the relationship of the church and the Lord. And finally, Benjamin, sit on my right hand. Ben Yamin, the, the son of my right hand. It's all there. Yeah, my mind is right. I'll give you my notes. You can preach them in Chicago. But, but back to the... To the uh, names of the ten yeah this is incredible so when you translate Adam right to Noah you get this man that's what it means you know Adam means man man appointed that's set name man appointed mortal sorrow but the blessed God will come down that's what the word Yared means come down declaring that his death will bring, that's Methuselah. It means his death will bring. That is sparing rest. Because Noah means rest. All that is in the Bible. So think about your reading, this powerful thing, and well, nobody knows it. Nobody bothers to know Jesus hidden in Scripture like that. So the Bible is more than just stories and you know, Daniel in the lion's den, and you keep going. It's the depth of Scripture will blow your head off in a good way. <laughs> yeah, it'll give you a brand new head, too, brand new mind. You'll get the old out and the new in. Amen. But the Bible is so wealthy. I mean, who would, who would imagine that God would hide my salvation and the Lord's life in the names of the saints. But there's so much more about the Bible. Now, when the Holy Spirit kind of is with you there, it's endless. Because he'll reveal his word to you. So here's what the Lord said. Now, lift, lift, lift your hands a second. Father, in Jesus' name, let them see it now. Now, let them see it. Let them understand what I'm about to talk about, Lord. I give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's talk about the Holy Spirit right now because this is what we need to understand. He is a person. Say that. 
All right, he's not an it, he's a person. And like I said earlier, when you see him as a person, you say, Lord, use me. I want to know you. And today we need the Holy Spirit more than ever. So he's a person. And his beauty is beyond description. His, his incredible personality, there's no way to describe it in our life. So people say, well, how do you know a person? Well, you don't know them by saying he has a body. You know them by saying he has a mind. He has his own will and he decides for himself. And emotions. So think about intellect. I mean, if you look at the body of someone dead in a casket, you don't say, there's a person. Not a person, it's a body. The person is gone. It's a shell, it's a tent, it's a house. That's correct. So it says that you, you sorrow not even as others. Why? Because they're gone. Absent from the body with the Lord, right? So the real person goes... When people die, their body dies. We don't die, our, only our shell dies. That's it, because then God gives us a brand new one. Simple. The Holy Spirit is a person. We are his body. But people ask me, well, does God the Father have a body? Of course he does. Because he said to Moses, I'll show you my back. So he has a body. He wrote the law with his fingers, it says. He has a body. So God the Father has a body. The, the, it says the, the pure in, in heart will see the Lord, will see God. Yes, God the Father has a body. Of course he does. And Moses saw him face to face, it says. Now, that's another subject. We'll talk about that later. But God the Son became flesh. God became flesh. That's why he's called the Son. Don't, don't let that confuse you. Because today it has confused other people. Well, they say, is Jesus God or the Son of God? I'm thinking, what Bible are they reading? <laughs> he is God in the flesh. And that's what it means by the Son of God. Begotten means he became flesh. That we might know the Lord because no man has seen God till he became flesh. Okay? He appeared in the Old Testament in a theophany, whether it's to Moses and others. And that's, like I said, it's a different subject for a different time. But God the Son became a man. And today, he is in heaven in the flesh, glorified body, seated on a throne, with God the Father. Now, the Holy Spirit has a body. Who is the body? We are. So when people say, does the Holy Ghost have a body? I say, yes, we are his body. Yeah. That's it, simple. Wow. But he's a person. He has amazing intellect to know the depth of God. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. You've got your Bible with you. You can use your... Okay, marvelous. And I'm going to have you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to read, beginning to read at verse 10. Okay? So, if I can, please, Pastor, one more time. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and you, sweet people, and ministers of the gospel in your homes. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Huh? You, sweet people of God, and pastors and ministers, this is a special time I'm having with pastors in Accra, Ghana, and you, you've been invited to be a part of this. So don't shut us out. Okay. In fact, let's begin reading verse 9, and then let's keep going. Please. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now God began to reveal these things to us already by spirit and continues and will continue to reveal them eternally. Did you hear what I said? I said eternally. So when, when you read verse 10, just keep that in mind. 
because it says here, no, no eye has seen, no ear hath heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But, let's go, verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now, I want to add that the word them is not in the original. So God hath, hath revealed and continues to reveal. For the Spirit searcheth, uh, present tense searcheth, all things, mm -hmm. even the deep things of God. Mm -hmm. Now, it didn't say searched, it said searcheth, which means he continues forever to search. Heaven will be glorious. And then it kind of helps us understand what we just read in verse 11, and it says... Yes. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? In other words, who knows you better than you? Mm -hmm. Your spirit knows you better than anyone, because you know you. Even so, Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. That's it. And verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Let's stop. So everything the Holy Spirit finds, he reveals to us without charge, mm. freely. Mama. So we are the ones who, who actually limit him when we don't search. We don't want to know. But in every believer, there's a hunger to know the Lord. And it says, which things we speak. We're doing it right now, right here. Not in the words which man's wisdom teach it, but the Holy Ghost teach it. And we compare spiritual things with spiritual means we compare the Old and New Testament together. The Old and the New comes together. All right, so here we see something powerful. That the Holy Spirit, may I give you this? has such amazing intellect to search the depth of God. No one can search the depth of God but the Holy Ghost. And now he reveals them to us. But more than that, he has will. He makes his own decisions. For it says in, in Scripture, he gives gifts as he wills. And even in this portion, we see his will, that he makes the decision to search Jesus, tell, uh, our precious Lord said very clearly, he will testify of me. It's his decision. He will guide you. He will teach you. He will show you things to come. He'll remind you of what I told you. All that has to do with decision making. So much more. And he has emotions. For it says in the book of Romans chapter 15, for the love of the spirit. He loves and you have to think about his love, which we don't often think about. So we think about the love of God the Father who gave us his son. We think about the love of Jesus that caused him to go to Calvary and die for us. But think about the love of the Spirit, that he comes and convicts us. And that takes a long time. Think about when he goes with you in the bar and tells you not to drink. But he goes with you here and there when you lived in sin to convict you, don't go there again. And he's there with you convicting you. It could take years before you wake up to, I need the Lord, you know. And then he brings you to the cross, brings you to Jesus. That's his love. He's so patient, long-suffering, merciful. Thank you, Lord. God, the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit. So he's a person. Now, uh, you can just shut this so we can, I can keep the battery and not lose. No, no, you can shut it for me. So yeah, it goes out. Yeah, there you go. But, but I want to just say this about that he's God. What are, what are the things you look for? What are the, the attributes of God? Well, omnipotence. Omniscience, yes, omnipresence. 
If anybody asks you, well, prove to me the Lord Jesus is God, just say, all right, there are five things that you look for. Number one, almighty, omnipotent. And ask them, is the, is the devil almighty? Are the angels almighty? Anybody you know? No. But, but you, you show them scripture of that Jesus is almighty because he holds all things by the word of his power. Number two, omniscience, all-knowing. In Colossians it says, in Christ are hid the treasures of knowledge. And number three, omnipresent. Only God is omniscient and omnipresent. He says, I'm with you always. And so much more. And number four, unchangeable. Never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And number three, eternal. For God to be God, he must be eternal. And Jesus said, I am. He didn't say I was. He didn't say I will be. He said, I am. It means he's eternal. And these are the things that the Holy Ghost is also. God Almighty, who is all, all power. He's the power of the Godhead. The angel said to Mary, the power of the highest will overshadow you. He, he's, he's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He searches the depth of God. He's omnipresent. Where shall I flee from your spirit, Lord, in the, in, in the Psalms? Where will I hide from your presence? So, and of course, unchangeable as God Almighty and eternal. He's called the eternal spirit in the book of Hebrews. So these prove to us he is God Almighty. Okay, and as God, we can know him. We can know him deeply, in fact. And not only is he a person with knowledge, intellect, and will and emotions, but the Holy Spirit can be grieved. And this is, this is a warning to all of us. Grieve not the Holy Spirit whereby you're sealed. And in that chapter we see clearly in Ephesians what grieves him. It's all there. We'll go and read it for you, for yourself. It's, it's you know, quite clear. Yeah, because we can lose him. He will walk away from us if we're not careful. That's why David said, take not your spirit from me, because it's possible. No, no, he doesn't leave you easily. He fights over you. It takes a long time before he can go or will go, because God Almighty is a very merciful and long-suffering God. But that doesn't give us the freedom to hurt him and to sin against him and to grieve him. We gotta be careful. But the blessed Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, not only is grieved, but there's one sin against him that has no forgiveness. Blasphemy. What, what is blasphemy? It's when you say his works are demonic. And some have, have, have said these things. Yeah. Thank you, brother. That man is something else. God bless him. What is your name again? Remind me. Daniel. Now, see, I don't need you now. I've got a table. <laughs> I need you more than, than the table, I promise you. Oh, I can even put my foot now. Rest. Thank you very much. So, the blessed Holy Spirit, if we blaspheme him, we lose him. And he'll never come back. That's the danger. Come on back and sit down here, brother. Come on. You sit back in your seat. Now, this is a biblical reference to, you know, when the man takes the humble place. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's, he's promoted. Yeah, he promoted. I'm really loving being in Ghana, by the way. <laughs> the precious people. I felt something was going to happen here. I really have been, uh, it's, well, it's been amazing the last few days, what the 
You know, you sense it in your heart, so precious. Oh, dear Jesus, we give you the praise. Lift your hands and thank him. We give you the praise, Lord. We give you all the glory and all the honor. To you belongs the majesty and exaltation forever. You are God Almighty, and we worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, let me continue because this is really important that we talk about the Holy Spirit. And please feel free, Pastor, to ask me any question you want about the Holy Ghost. But just a few more things I want to say about him. I did not know, and I'm sure many of you have read Good Morning. If you haven't, you've probably heard about it from somebody. But I was introduced to the Holy Spirit in a very dramatic way in a Catherine Kuhlman meeting. Nobody had told me prior. No pastor had ever brought that up to me. In any church I attended, and I went to church every night. I mean every night in Canada. I got saved in 72. I was in church every single day. And my father thought I lost my mind, so he took me to a psychiatrist because he didn't think anybody can go to church every day, and I did. And the, and the psychiatrist said, there's nothing wrong with your, with your son. There was nothing wrong. I was just hungry for, for the Lord. I wanted to know the Lord. But the thing is, when Catherine Kuhlman introduced the Holy Spirit to me, no one had said any such words prior. I went to a massive church called the Catacombs on Thursday night, led by Merv and Merla Watson. That's where the song Jehovah Jireh was written, by the way, by Merla Watson. She's still to this day a friend of mine. They're, in the, they're up in their 80s, living in Vancouver, BC, precious people. And we had the greatest speakers in those days. 3,000 young people, 3,000 would pack that massive cathedral downtown Toronto. We had the best of the best and the most anointed people you can think about. But nobody ever really talked about the Holy Spirit like Catherine Kuma did. Because she stopped in a service. Healings had been taking place for a good hour or more. And she stops. And she puts her head down over her arm and starts to sob and weep. So everybody stopped and looked, like, what happened? And she picks up her head. Her face was beaming with power. I'll never forget that her face was red, 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 like fire on it. And she looked and she said, please, we was begging, pleading, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And I had never heard anyone uh, say those words with such intense power in, in their words, you know. And I was just stunned. She said, please don't grieve him. And then she said, he's all I have. He's all I got, word for word. And then in this incredible moment, and I wish I could describe the atmosphere in that meeting. There's no way. It was like you, you're in heaven. Literally, the atmosphere was so heavenly, so charged with the presence and holiness of the Lord. When she said, he's all I have. He's all I got. And then she said, he is more real to me than you. And those words pierced my soul like a sword of fire. And a cry in my heart just cried out, Lord, I want to know you like this. And I didn't just say it. You know, calmly, I was so intense when I said it. You know, I didn't say it where anybody heard me. That's my whole heart was crying it out. And that's how it began. Then that same night in my bedroom in Canada, in Toronto, we drove seven hours from Pittsburgh back to, to where, where I live in Canada because I was in the U.S. and we had to drive back home on a bus wonderful people who came to the service. And I felt like someone was pulling me down on my knees to pray. And my body was physically tired. And out of my lips, I heard myself say, without even planning to say. Because at that moment, I was so stunned by what Catherine said. And I said, for the first time, I addressed him, first time ever, I said, Holy Spirit. I never addressed him. As I always said, Lord Jesus, or 
God or Father, but I never really said, spoke the words Holy Spirit. And I was speaking in tongues already. I was, I, I, I would pray in tongues, but I never addressed him till that night. I said, Holy Spirit. And I thought to myself, am I supposed to talk to him? Because nobody told me I could. And, I, and in my heart, I thought, well, if I'm wrong, God will correct me, will show me. And I continued, I said, Catherine Kuhlman said, you're her friend. And I shouldn't say those words in the service, but when somebody says, he, he, he's, he's all, he's all. Yeah, don't grieve him. She knows, she knows the Holy Spirit. I said, Catherine said, you're her friend. Can I know you? It was simple words, really, but a great moment for my life. And a few minutes, maybe 10 minutes maximum, had gone by, nothing happened. I thought, well, you know, maybe nothing would happen. And just suddenly, suddenly, I felt an atmosphere around me. I had my eyes closed. And when the atmosphere came into that room, my bedroom, I'm thinking, or I'm in heaven, or I'm back in Pittsburgh. Because that's what I felt in the service. And I opened my eyes, I'm in my room. And I didn't know what else to say that night. It just was charged. So I went to sleep. And in the morning, to my amazement and surprise, I'm not planning to say any word, I say, good morning, Holy Spirit. And that presence came right back. And for that whole year, it continued. There's something I never really shared that I like to share today. I was thinking about that only a few days ago. <clears throat> in, in the summer of that year, and that continued every day, every day, his presence was so rich and so blessed and pure. But the first thing, let me just say this before I tell you what happened in the summer. So that morning, I just looked up and I said, would you please show me from scripture who you are? Because I, I said good morning and that presence came right back. And I said, show me who you are. And the words I heard, the words I, I literally heard someone say, like I just told you, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 was the first words I heard. And I, didn't, I never read that chapter or even remember that, but it's a great chapter, but I didn't ever pay attention to it, really. And my eyes fell on verse 9. Just I had you read that exact portion. And that was the beginning. And then he had me go to the portion in the book of Luke when the Lord was being baptized. And, and I began to slowly see he is not God the Father. He's not God the Son. He's God the Holy Spirit. And I, I, I of course, didn't know everything in that day because it just began, the relationship began. And every day I would talk to him. I would say, help me read the Bible. You're, you're the one who wrote it. Holy Spirit, I don't know God like you do. Help me know him. Um, you know, I don't know Jesus like you do. Help me know him. I want to know my, my wonderful father. Help me know him. And that was like simple talk like that, innocent talk. But he answered my prayer to my amazement. And amazing things began happening in my room that Oh my dear goodness, I, there's no way I can even tell you all of them. But the impact it had on the kids in the catacombs that traveled. We traveled June of 74. This, this took place with Ms. Kuhlman, December 21st, 73. So June of 20, uh, 74, June of 74. Mervyn Merle Watson took a tour, first to England, then Holland, then Switzerland. And we, on the tour, we ministered in, in you know, many, many churches. And they, they called it Shekinah or Shekinah or glory for the tour of a group. 
there were, there were 63 young people. I was one of them that traveled from cathedral to cathedral. The concerts were held mostly in big cathedrals. In London, they had the concert at Trafalgar Square. And 6,000 people came. It was a big crowd. And I was one of the kids that was ministering. And there's a big film that, uh, I, I, you know, I've not seen it yet, that, uh, that the Watsons still have. And you see us ministering. But every night, they would put us, uh, there were three of us that shared uh, the same homes. We stayed in, in, in uh, uh, homes that uh, youth with a mission mostly, YWAMers, we stayed with, with people from, from uh, youth with a mission. And in my room were three, it were two young people. One was called Nunu from, from, from Portugal. And the other was called Mike. And Michael was a, was a big guy. And Nunu was a little guy. And so was I. And I would pray audibly, and they are trying to sleep. So we have three beds, whatever, whatever house we're in. Uh, they one time were in this garage almost place. And uh, so every night I would audibly pray, and they would be very quiet. They didn't know what, what, why I was doing it. So I would talk to the Holy Spirit, and I would keep talking to him. And these two guys, I never, I've never talked about that. But every night when I would talk to the Holy Spirit, they were, they were stunned, laying, trying to sleep, and they couldn't sleep because I was talking out loud, <laughs> not in my head. And uh, Mike, uh, he actually married a young uh, a girl named Anne, who was very wonderful people from England. She was a wonderful girl from England. He's from the U.S., so he's laying on the, on the bed across the room one day, and he says to me, Benny, you can feel him in here. He said, we don't understand, we don't understand it, but we can feel him in here. It was precious that these two young men who didn't know why I'm talking to the Holy Spirit were, were, were in, in awe of that, these moments in my life. So don't be ashamed of him, because somebody will be, will be blessed and touched. Because people ask me, my mother-in-law asked me, she said, well, Benny, who do we talk to? That's what she said. This is a pastor's wife, at that time the largest church in the United States called Calvary Assembly Orlando. And Pauline, my mother-in-law, I love dearly, I still do, she, she's in heaven today. She is a saint from London, the British, you know. And her, and her mom went through the war. And then they immigrated in 52 to the United States. And Roy was in the military. He was in the British military. And they told me many stories. He used to play piano for Smith Wildwood, my father-in-law. And, and my, my gra uh, Suzanne's grandma, Lil, used to sing at the uh, big opera house. Yeah, anyways. Uh, the, she sang at the Royal Albert Hall. So her daughter says to me one day, Pauline says, Benny, you tell us about the Holy, the Holy Spirit, but who do I talk to? Do I talk to the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit? I said, Pauline, I said, Pauline, there's, there's no competition in the God, <laughs> in the God. You can talk to all three at the same time. I said, there's no competition. And she said, that's a good answer. <laughs> but the thing is with me, I believe, as Catherine herself said many times, the more you know the Holy Spirit, the more you know Jesus. Now, about three, four years ago, I don't know how it happened, but it happened when somebody said, who is he? And out of my being, I knew and I said, He's Jesus unlimited. And it stunned them and it stunned me too. It was like the Lord himself showed me that. He is Jesus without limit. I was listening a few days ago to Billy Graham's daughter, Anne, and she was preaching on the Holy Spirit. And she said, he is Jesus without skin. 
And I thought, that's good, Aaron. <laughs> now, I never met her. One day I'm going to meet her and tell her. What a beautiful way to describe him. He's Jesus without skin. I said Jesus without limit. Same thing. But he is the one who makes Jesus more real to us than the crowd that saw him. Think about this. Think just this is incredibly, uh, very, very, very powerful. The crowds that saw him 2,000 years ago never sensed his presence. They saw him, they heard him, but they did not know his presence. Today, we've not seen him physically or heard him audibly, but we know him and we've sensed his presence through his spirit. So think about they saw him, heard him, and did not know him. Today, we know him, and we hear him, and we see him. By the Spirit, he is more real to us than our neighbor, or the guy next door to you right now, sitting next to you. He's, he's more real to you and me than my own parents, who are gone now. He's more real to us than us. How is that possible? By the Holy Spirit. Now, 2,000 years ago, they saw him and did not love him. Today, we haven't seen him and we love him. How? Who gives us that love and reality? The Holy Spirit. Think about what I'm telling you. Now, let's, let's just talk about a few things here that I think are very important. I'm going to ask you a question. If you were there, Dan, if you were there, and, and, and dear Pastor Josh, and me, myself, ask the, that same question. If we were with him physically 2,000 years ago on the boat on the Sea of Galilee, the storm hit, he stands up and commands the storm to be still. But when we were there, or the Mount of Transfiguration, and we physically saw, we physically saw the Lord transfigured. We physically saw his face change, his hair change in color, his clothing change in color, and began to shine bright and brighter than the sun, it says. Mm -hmm. and we were there. Would that have changed our life? Mm -hmm. You have to think about that because, because it did not change their life. It didn't change Peter, no. who denied him. No. So you, you ask, now, how can you deny the Lord after you saw, you were there, Peter. You were there. You saw him shine. And you heard, and let's say we were there too, we heard the voice of God audibly say, this is my son. Now, when, when the father spoke and the Lord was being baptized, Peter, James, and John, from what we know, were not there. But here they are on the mountain. And they hear, this is my son. Here, yeah. And they hide. They, 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 they're frightened. And then they see physically Moses, who nobody else saw. And Elijah, together. Nobody ever saw the two together. But Peter, James, and John saw them together with the Lord. And they heard him talk about they heard them talk about the cross and the work of the cross. It didn't change them. That's like shocking. Like, like, wait a minute. Peter, wake up. Knock, knock. How can you deny him when you saw that? Or you were there when he said, Lazarus, come forth. And you still went home? When he died on the cross, you all left him. How could you? 
But not Peter, not just James and John. All of them left him. John was there out of friendship more than anything else. <laughs> John wasn't there because he believed. He was there because that's my friend up there on the cross. Now, why, could, why would they leave? Why would they question? And then on the way to Emmaus, his own relative, Cleopas, who was married to his aunt, you knew that, right? Cleopas was married to Mary, the sister of Mary. So Mary had a sister named Mary also. And that's another story. Because it's possible in, in a Jewish family to, be, to have a sister or a brother with the, with the same name to honor the memory of some relative or biblical figure. It doesn't matter, sorry. So Mary and Mary and her sister Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary, her sister, married to Cleopas, who was a relative of the Lord, walking with another disciple, we don't know his name, and they're talking, and now the Lord appears and says, and they say, we thought he was the one. What do you mean you thought he was the one? How could you say that? Now, after, after all they, they, they saw, the miracles, like, Think about just a few miracles. The miracles that, are, that we read about in the, in the Word of God. They saw the dead raised. They saw Jesus walk on water and command the storm. They saw the lepers cleansed and multitudes healed. And when he died, they all said, ah, we thought he was the one, and they walk away. Why? It's not by might. Not by, by, listen, it's not by might. They saw the might. They saw him walk on water. That's might. They saw him calm the storm. That's might. They saw him raise the dead. That's might. And it's not by power. They saw him heal the sick by the multitudes. Oh, what power is that? The blind saw and the lame walked and the deaf heard. It's by my spirit. So without the Holy Spirit, without the Holy Spirit, miracles will be forgotten. Without the Holy Spirit, the voice of God will be dismissed. Well, they dismissed it. Like Israel, they heard God speak audibly and he gave them the Ten Commandments audibly. But without the Holy Ghost, they said, ah, let's just build a calf and call it God. How could you? You saw the mountain shake and the fire, and you, and you heard the voice of God, and you said to Moses, we're so scared, we're going to die. And then you decide to change that God into an animal? How could, it be? How could you? It's not by might, nor by power. They, in fact, rebelled against God. Today the problem is people are seeking signs and wonders, not the Holy Ghost. Signs and wonders will turn you into a rebel. Without the Lord, you'll become a rebel. Because that's what happened to all of them. A whole nation became rebels and they saw signs and wonders. They didn't want God at all. They just said, well, can God furnish us a table? If he's God, come on, let's have dinner. Where's the table with food? How insulting. They became rebellious and arrogant because all they wanted is power, serve me. Where's my table and food? They saw him as power, not as a person. Are you getting it? Without knowing the person of the Holy Spirit, all that power will mean nothing to you. All the miracles, you'll dismiss them. By my spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit who changed them because when the Holy Ghost came in, the Holy Ghost did not come. Now I'm going to say something to kind of wake some of you up. The people, people say the Holy Ghost came on the, on the day of Pentecost wrong. His power came on the day of Pentecost. He came on the, when Jesus said, receive the Holy Ghost. And he breathed on them. 
truly see the Holy Ghost. That's when he came. And he dwelled within them and lived within them. But he said, the Lord said, wait till you be endued with power. He didn't say the Holy Ghost will come. He said the power will come. Wait till you be endued with power to be witnesses unto me. The Holy Ghost was already there. Because had the Holy Ghost not been there before Pentecost, before Pentecost, Peter stood up and said, brethren, we need to do something about rep replacing Judas here. And he knew the scriptures suddenly. He came alive. You don't pray all those days without the Holy Ghost helping you. Are you listening? <laughs> so to today, wait on the Holy Ghost. Look, look. When Jesus comes into your, your heart, the Holy Ghost is there already. But you can receive his power later. Yes. Yes. This is Bible. I didn't believe that when I got saved. I thought, no, it's a separate experience. You know, Jesus comes and the Holy Ghost comes. No, no. The Holy Spirit comes with Jesus because he is Jesus. Remember? He's Jesus unlimited. Without skin. I like that. I like both of them. Now, now, here's the thing that is also very, very serious and very, very important. They did not know the Lord. Everything he said, they could not even understand before he left. Jesus used his personality, his influence with them before he breathed upon them. And they would stand by and say... What did he say? He, he's coming down from the mountain of transfiguration. And he talks about the cross. He says, I, I'm, I'm going to die and be raised. And Peter, James, and John said, what is he talking about? Why? Without the Holy Ghost, you can't even get it. So they saw the power, they hear the voice of God, they see Elijah, they see Moses, they see his glory, but they don't even understand what he just said. Why? Without the Holy Spirit, it makes no sense. Even if the Son of God tells you, we know no man after the flesh, not even Christ. Because he's limited. He was limited. He was always in one place at one time prior to the Holy Ghost coming. But then, something changed. <sighs> and now Peter is a changed man. And Jesus said in John 16, it's better for you that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the Holy Ghost will not come. But when he comes, he will reveal all things to you. All truth to you. You'll know it all. You'll see it all. And he'll remind you of things I told you because you have forgotten them already. He'll remind you. And how well they, they remembered. They remembered so well, Pastor Dan, that when they gave us the Gospels, they would remember every word that he spoke. Fifty years later, the Gospels were not written a week later. Now, you and I will forget something from a month ago if somebody preaches it. Well, do, your people, do your people remember every sermon you preached a year ago? Absolutely. No. Do your people remember? No. But they remembered every sermon. Do you remember the, do you now know by heart the Sermon on the Mount? No. But they remembered it 50 years after he spoke it. Later, much later. Some, some say earlier, some say later. It was years before the gospel was written. Because while they were alive, they were sharing from house to house, from mouth to mouth. Nothing was written yet. Then they wrote it into letters because they were getting old. I did a lot of research on how the Bible came, came together. And it came together quite simply. At first, they would simply talk it. Somebody, tell somebody, tell somebody, somebody. It began with the apostles and their disciples, and it just spread. Now the apostles were all getting old. Some, some of them had been killed, and they decided, you know what? We need to write it down. So they began writing what they saw and what they heard, and those letters went from church to church, from house to house, 
And finally they said, let's put it all together. The, the early fathers said, we need to put it together. Because the apostles were getting killed, martyred. They were dying. And, and think about that as they wrote those letters, 40 and 50 years after, they remembered every word. Why? The Holy Ghost will bring things to your remembrance. Is more powerful than me saying, oh, he's helping me remember what I read in the Bible. Well, he does. They asked Billy Graham when, when he was very old, if he remembered his sermons. He said, no. He said, that's why I wrote them down. Because with age, we lose our memory. Physically, we, we lose things we preached and songs we used to sing and chapter and verse of a certain portion. We have to go back and look for it it's because of age. But the Holy Ghost, that's a different story. He'll bring things to your remembrance. It's, that's incredible. Now, what would cause someone, and I'm just talking about how much the church needed him. But let's talk about something else. Jesus became more real to them after he left than before, than while he was there. They understood more after he left than while he was there because they said, oh, that's what it means. Remember that? Because they, they read the Old Testament but did not get it. And then they began, to, oh, it says, oh, we saw, oh, now we understand. All by the Spirit, they began putting it together. And for James to stand up in Acts 15 and talk about Amos was a, a remarkable moment where, where he remembered what the prophets wrote so they would not force the church to go back into Judaism. And Stephen amazes me. He was 19 years old, 20 max, and he gave such a powerful defense by giving the history of Israel with details. How did he remember? They were so stunned, they went into a rage against him when he declared to them the prince of life through scripture. It was powerful. So think about they knew more about Jesus after he left than while he was there. They knew Jesus better after he left than while he was there. They remembered what he said after he left than while, while he was there. By the Spirit. Now here's something else. Here's something else. You all love to praise and worship, right? Yeah. How many love to praise and worship? Can you worship if a lion was tearing your leg off? Oh. Yeah, very difficult. Can you sing hallelujah if some massive tiger was tearing your body apart? And if, if you said yes, I'd have to pray for you, brother. Yeah. No way, bye. But it happened. It happened in Rome, Italy, when Christians were burning and singing at the same time. They were burning. Nero put them on poles and burned them in the arena. They were fed to vicious animals, praising the Lord and worshiping. And when Nero decided, this is all history, Nero decided, I'm going to go down and look at them. And he saw bodies torn apart, and he was stunned that every face that was still a face was smiling. Well, how can they worship and burn, or worship and be torn apart? I go back, it's not by my, nor by power, but by my spirit, that the Holy Ghost made Jesus more real than the animals. Jesus made, listen, listen, the Holy Ghost made, dear God, I feel that. Jesus was more real to them than the fire. More real to them than the lions. More real than the tigers. More real than those vicious animals. How we need the Holy Ghost now. And they loved him. To worship him while burning. Come on, guys. They loved him. But, but let's also go a few hundred years ago. We say, well, okay, that was happening down way there, then uh, 2,000 whatever years ago. Well, let's talk about just a few hundred years ago. Let's talk about today. The martyrs of today that are 
that are being sacrificed, that are being persecuted around, throughout the world? What would cause them to say, chop it off? Men in Libya, a few years ago, they chopped their heads off for not denying Jesus. Deny him, we're going to chop your head off. They said, cut him off. They would not deny the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit. You may say, well, but these people are not Christians like we are. How do you know that? Why would anybody say, chop my head off? if they did not love the Lord. Maybe they're not Pentecostals. No, look, look, look. It's Jesus. It's not Pentecostals and Charismatics and Lutherans and Episcopals and Catholics and whatnot. It's Jesus. As long as he's in their heart, they're our brothers and sisters. And today, I would really recommend you read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Anybody has? How many have not? You, maybe you have not even heard of it, some of you. Fox's Book of Martyrs is a book that talks about the martyrdoms in the church, how people have died for the faith. You'll be amazed. I've read that book four times now. It'll amaze you to read about Jan Hus, William Tyndale, Ignatius and others that suffered for the faith, that gave us the Bible. They killed William Tyndale, who gave us the English Bible. He was praising the Lord and burning at the same time. And they said that when they burned him, that the, the crowds, the enemies were, were screaming and saying horrible things. And he was praising the Lord and his voice was louder than the enemies while burning for the faith. And Ignatius and others like them. And Clement, so many of them that suffered for the faith were praising and worshiping. How could they? Well, how could they also 2,000 years ago? It's not by might or power. How we need the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Lift your hands, come on. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in your strength and your power come in your own special way come holy spirit i need you can you please put this wonderful mic on here for him on the piano come sweet spirit i pray help me sing again Come in your strength and your power. Come in your own special way. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is peace. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is love. There is comfort in life's darkest hour. There's light and life. There's health and power in the Spirit, in the Spirit of the Lord. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is peace. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is love. There is comfort in life's darkest hour. There's light and life and health and power in the Spirit. In the spirit of the Lord, sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. 
the Lord who reigns in beauty. Bless the Lord who reigns with riches and with power. I bless the Lord who makes my life with so much love.
Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Lift your hands, let's welcome him. As he wants to do what he wants to do, let him do it. Freely, Lord. Do that work in our hearts. The one, that one you want to work in our hearts. We ask you to do it. The Lord bless the people of Ghana. Bless the young ministers that are in this room. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome We mean our hearts, Lord, our lives. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome in this place. Fill all the hungry and thirsty Restore us, O oh Father. Revive us once again. Holy Spirit, our welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou. Oh, 
It's all over you. The Spirit gave the promise. He said, my power will descend. Even now it's happening. He said, from your inner being. Even the cameraman is gone. 
there'll be a river with no end. Fill my cup, Lord. Fill it up, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. You can do it. You can be, you can be the cameraman. Come on. Come on. Jackson, you, come on. You be the cameraman of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Here's my cup. Here's my life, Lord. Fill it up and make me whole. Fill my cup, Lord, one more time. Fill my cup, Lord. We need it, Lord. We need it now. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsty of my soul. Pray. Here's my cup, here's my life, here's my life, here's my life. Fill it up and make me whole. Keep praying, keep praying. That's right, God is not finished yet. Like the woman of the well, we've been seeking for things that cannot satisfy. Over here, Jim. But today we heard the Savior speaking. He said, Draw from my well. And my goodness, he did. That never shall run dry. They're receiving it now here in Ghana. Fill my cup, Lord. You two in your homes receive it. I lift it up, Lord. Tell him, Come and quench. This thirsty in my soul, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Here's my cup, here's my life, here's my life, here's my life, fill it up and make me. Now this is the time to ask God for something you really want. Lift your hands and lift your voice and ask Him for it. Tell Him what it is you want. This is the moment in this blessed anointing moment. This is the moment to ask God for something you've never asked Him for before. This is now the time to lift up your voice to heaven above with all that's within your soul and ask as you've never asked before and don't ask for a cup full the ocean is yours take the limits off don't limit him don't limit him don't limit him this is not the time to question God and limit God no no limits no limits Ask for big things. Ask for large things. He's enlarging your hearts. He's enlarging your heart to receive it. Put the camera on the crowd. Let them see the crowd. This is the time to ask mightily, largely. This is not the time to ask for little. He said, enlarge the place of your tents. Enlarge that place. Enlarge your hearts. Don't limit the Lord right now. Come on. Ask him, ask him, ask him, ask him, ask him. Mine eyes have seen the glory. Ask him. Of the coming of the Lord. Of the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. Sing it. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible sweet sword. His truth is marching on. Here in Ghana. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory. Glory, 
glory. Hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Keep singing it in your key. Tell them what key. Keep praying, keep praying. It's happening. You ask now, you ask now, you ask now. Lord, Don't limit God. Never limit Him. Pray hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. It's true. have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord he is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored he has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible sword his truth is marching on every prayer hear every cry your people here in Ghana have called upon your name you've given us the privilege to ask unworthy as we are sinful men and women we look to your mercy and grace Forgive, Lord. Forgive, Lord, and have compassion upon us. Cleanse our souls. Purge our hearts. Remove the obstacles the world has placed before us. Set our path clean and straight before us. Let your word be our shining light. In this out of darkness, bless these wonderful people of Ghana, these hungry men and women. Use the mighty Lord to shake this nation and the world. Silence the voice of the enemy through their voice. Let the voices be loud and clear and crystal and heavenly against the enemies of the gospel give these people a voice louder mightier purer than the voice of the enemies they will pierce the voice of satan and destroy it in this land and beyond they will stop the voices of the enemies of the gospel Let your people here in Ghana, Lord, be instruments of power. Instruments of power. In the mighty name of Jesus. Remove every obstacle from before them. Establish their path. Let them see their way clearly. And give Pastor Joshua a new door of opportunity in Ghana. Let, let his voice pierce through to the leaders of this nation. In the name of Jesus, give them an ear to hear the voice, your voice through him. That he'll go beyond, farther beyond what his father had gone already in this country and nation. 
You've established him here, Lord. You've established him here for this moment, for this generation, for this hour, that their destiny will be fulfilled. Everyone in this room, Lord, everyone beyond this room, let their destiny be fulfilled in you. Not outside of you. Only in you. Don't let them mess it up. Don't let any of us mess it up. And if any have, Lord, you're the God of redemption and restoration. Just like Samson of old, you restored his strength. He slew more of the enemies in his entire life. May we do the same. Instruments of light, dispelling and destroying the darkness before us. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray every word spoken against any one of us right now is destroyed. No weapon formed against us will prosper. Every tongue that arises against us is stopped now and destroyed. We are your heritage. We are your saints. And with the authority you've given us right now, we destroy every word. We stop every word. It goes, goes back where it came from. In the name of Jesus. He said, Thou shall condemn it, and we condemn it in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray, speak a new word right now over your people. A word of blessings and multiplication, power in the Holy Ghost. That Pastor Joshua, Lord, will see the day when this whole nation will bow at the name of Jesus. Bow at the name of Jesus. That Jesus will be and always shall be Lord over Ghana. In Jesus' name. We give this land to you, Lord. And its future to you, Lord. That the ministry here through these men and women be like a fiery lake and a fiery river in this land in Jesus name hallelujah we have just had as you saw a powerful service with a group of pastors that are pastors of the church with pastor Joshua Dagg and church. yeah and please pray that as we continue having these meetings here There'll be masses of people tomorrow and for the, for the, for the weekend. So just pray that, that the Lord will have his way. And thank you for being with us. And we, and we want to pray with you, all of us. Yes. Let's believe God for our people, that God will use them wherever they yes. are. Yeah. Lord, we thank you for thank what you're doing in their life. Yes, you, bless them, bless them and use them in thank Jesus' you, name, Lord. And the anointing that we experienced here tonight, let it be yes. also experienced by them wherever yes, they are yes, in Jesus yes. name we give you praise amen amen I'm gonna ask amen. you to sow seed now in the Lord's work look this is gonna be and already is a most awesome year a most awesome year this is the time to give like we've never given ever in our life so let's do it for the Lord's work and his glory you can give on the platform you're watching us on you can go to our website, bennyhin.org, or simply text BHM45777. And we'll be coming to you more from the meetings. Okay, much love. See you again. Bye-bye.